Hey everybody, it's Dr. David with another episode of Ask Dr. David. Um, I was asked by one of the reporters who interviewed me last week about the statements from the Florida Surgeon General where he had said that the state of Florida officially was saying that children, sh recommending children not be vaccinated against COVID-19. And then the following two days later, there was a more formal statement put forward by the Department of Health. And I was asked if I could comment regarding these more updated and more formal statements. Now, for anybody who may have seen briefly, I had posted this video uh, at the end of last week, so today being the 14th of March, but there were some significant difficulties with our technology and we decided to scrap that and record it again. So thank you for the 44 people who did get to watch it before we ended up taking it down. And so hopefully you'll watch it again now. Maybe I'll even say a thing or two differently since we do this live. So I'm also going to be doing something that's a little bit of a different format and that I'm going to be doing some screen sharing with you so I can be more specific on what the um, on what on what the text of all of this information is because it's going to get a little into the weeds and I want to make sure that I have the information directly right. So I'm going to go ahead and move into our screen share mode and hopefully this is going to kick in very quickly. Okay. All right, so you can see here March 8th, so last week, the state of Florida put forth what they call the Guidance for Pediatric COVID-19 Vaccines. And it starts off here with some, as I said, some different wording. And I want to go through this because there are there is a lot written here that I agree with. And I want to um, be clear on what those things are. So here's what you see. First of all, Florida recognizes that the parents should always be empowered to make the best health decisions for their children. Of course, that's something that we have said from day one. That's been a part of my core philosophy that parents should be empowered and should be first and foremost responsible for the decisions that are made for their child. It is essential that healthcare providers review all data to evaluate risks and benefits unique to each patient when determining when healthcare services should be provided, including the administration of COVID vaccines. Of course, again, this is true. This is what I'm here for as a physician in order to look case by case for each of my patients and in, in order to provide guidance, some thoughts, ways of looking at things, looking at benefits, looking at risks of decisions. And so, of course, very important for us to be able to share that effectively with the families that we're doing consultations consultation with. And of course, being made on an individual basis, absolutely. Now, this statement here, as the risk of administering COVID-19 vaccines, children may outweigh the benefits. Um, the Florida Department has issued the following guidance. Okay, so again, this is a word where you see here the word may outweigh the benefits versus risks. And we're going to go through the rest of the information that you can see here, some of these links that are listed here that they're using to inform the decision. So it says here, based on available data, health, um, healthy children aged 5 to 17 may not benefit from receiving the current available va um, COVID vaccines. The doc department recommends that children with underlying conditions are the best candidates for the COVID-19 vaccine. And I do agree with that. Um, certainly those people who are mo as ri most at risk, I would also say those who live with are in, in significant contact with people that are most at risk are certainly the people, the families who could benefit the most from getting vaccinated against SARS-CoV-2. Um, now here, where they talked about the, may not benefit from receiving the current um, available, and of course that's very true, especially if a person, a child, has had COVID-19 already, and especially, especially so, if they've already had Omicron. Now, of course, we've talked about that uh, Omicron is providing protection, immunological protection, not just against Omicron, but against the previous variants as well. Whereas we saw that people with previous variants of COVID are not being protected as much against Omicron, although it certainly does seem as if those people, those children would be more protected because they have some antibodies. And that's also true for people who choose to be vaccinated as well. Basically, whether a person has antibodies and immunity, whether it was derived from a vaccine or whether it was derived from the, a virus, a wild virus itself, of course, it's going to provide some level of immunity. Doesn't mean that it will provide what we call sterilizing immunity where there's no symptoms whatsoever, but in terms of the significant reduction of deaths and of severe hospitalizations, et cetera. And although those are rare occurrences that can happen with SARS-CoV-2, we know that those things still can happen. And so that is, of course, something for people to be taking into account when they're doing their risks versus benefits. Okay, so here and now here's where some of this gets very interesting. And in my opinion, what they are presenting here is not actually supporting what they're saying here. But I want to break this through here. So at the present time, they say 
that there are certain risks to consider that may outweigh the benefits among healthy children with underlying um, con- with no underlying conditions. And the first thing you'll hear, you see here, it says limited risk of severe illness due to COVID-19. And one of the things that they do is they quote this, um, this particular article here that you'll see where it does come down and they do say here that... Um, um, that while they were assessing it, they did say that in this particular study that there were no significant um, morbidity or mortality associated with the COVID disease itself, which, of course, that was true in this particular study. Now, the interesting thing here is this is kind of an update of the original data that I reviewed when put forth the question as to whether should be children vaccinated originally when I presented it to the FDA. And as you may remember, there were approximately 2,250 um, st- um, kids that about 750 placebos there. And what they found in this particular study that in the 750 placebos that to those who didn't get vaccinated, that none of those kids died, none of those kids were hospitalized. Now, 750, as I said then, when we were talking about the side effects for the vaccines, is also a very small number, relative speaking, to people who would die, children who would die, or people, or children who would um, be severely hospitalized, because we do know that those situations, while present, are much less common. And so it's certainly possible that just by chance, that out of 750 people who um, who were in the placebo group, that they did not develop, um, that, that they did, did not develop death, or God forbid, or with hospitalization, there is still the likelihood that that chance could be involved with there too, or it just may not have been enough people in order to make enough stu- enough children in order to make that assessment. So, but it was kind of interesting though, because one of the things that they do in this very article that they um, that they present here is they do go ahead and make recommendations that children be vaccinated. Let me come down here to the discussion and with their final conclusions here is that you know the the study that the Florida um, Surgeon General is doing does specifically say here the data reports um, here in supervising that um, that vaccination uh, with a two dose with this series um um, it's uh, that it, it supports the vaccination. So, of course, the state of Florida is coming up with a different conclusion. What these authors do, everybody's entitled to um, their own opinion when it comes to interpreting data. Um, but certainly this is, and they notice it's ongoing. That's why this is something that was released in January of 2022, even though the authorization originally came through last year. So that was one of the things that came out here. So, um that, but it is true, limited risk of severe illness, but it is also true that they do, that it occur. High prevalence of existing immunity among children. And this quote here, now, this is something from the um, from the NIH, from the um, from the government. And when they first came to us um, at looking at this, it, uh, let's unclick these things here to realize what incredible gobbledygook this type of data is that was presented to us. Um, it'll take a little longer here. Let's see if this is going to go. Maybe it's not liking my clicks. Oh, well. Well, anyways, I would have then unclicked it. Oh, here we go. And you can start to see all of this data that starts to show up all over the place. And what they're doing here, so I'm going to now take those away. Those are different ages. But what I, the reason why I wanted to show you this is that from my perspective, this data is all over the place. Okay. Now, these are specifically for children here. And I'm going to scroll up a little bit here. And as you can see, these so what they're doing here is they are checking different types of um, antigen, anti bodies against the against the nucleocapsid, the spike, non uh, spike and nucleocapsid, as we've talked about in our office, we recommend checking both of these, especially if you may have had the disease or if you want to know if there's real ongoing protection, having both of those antibodies present is even more evidence that a person does have protection and there's not specified. And as you'll see here, they had studies going through 2021 where 100% of or so of children showed antibodies. And of course, not everybody was vaccinated, which would imply that there were um that it was from natural as well. But you'll also hear that there are other studies that showed actually close to zero protection in some of these populations. So Yes, if they were to want to cherry pick, and yes, there are some of these that show that everybody, all these kids have immunity there. I think it would be false considering all the the, the preponderance of this data to make the conclusion and, and to say we should just focus on these up here and ignore those down there. Now, by all means, yes, it's true that most kids, you know, there were similar studies that were done in England that showed so many children, and in England, they don't even do vaccinations there, and so many kids do have these, these antibodies present, and of course, those who have antibodies present, then the vaccine would provide less of a benefit to them because they would have some level of protection, as I said before. So again, they're, what they're talking about here is their statement about the high prevalence of, of, of existing immunity, which I, again, I agree it's true, but it is, but absence of data informed um, informing benefit of COVID among children with existing immunity. Right. So again, 
those with existing immunity, that's the type of study we really need to see. Not was a person vaccinated and do they then go on to develop COVID-19 or either asymptomatic, mild, or even severe, but really what it is the, the percentage of children who are protected because they have these antibodies either way? Great question. More research is needed. I think a very important question when we're trying to weigh the risk versus benefit of the vaccine versus the risk versus the benefit of getting the disease, which is what I've discussed previously is one of the things that is the, may be the most important thing when trying to really put this together, creating both of those lists. Okay. So now they went on to say in, in clinical um, trials, higher than anticipated severe adverse events occurred among those receiving the vaccine. So that is what this document is here. Okay. And what they're doing is they're comparing the vaccine to placebo. So in other words, kids who did not get the vaccine. OK, and one of the interesting things here is I know they do not show P values. And if you know about statistics, a P value of less than 0 0.05 means that it's not just based on chance. It's really the probability that it was a real study, a real um, findings. And you'll see here in terms of any events, you'll certainly see very similar numbers for any type of event, whether it was in a vaccine form or in the placebo form. Furthermore, in terms of serious events, you'll see that there were four versus one, which again, those are not big enough numbers either way to know that this, def this necessarily makes a difference. And also in terms of um, discontinuation of the vaccine. So again, if you look at any of these numbers and you compare them to pl the placebo, I just don't see a big enough number difference here that they were over to say that this is a significant increase over what a person would be getting from a placebo. And we know that placebos can cause side effects, just like we know placebos can cause benefits. And that's why we do a placebo control study to see if there's a significant difference between the two. Now here, Reduced COVID e vaccine efficacy among children f um, 5 to 17, okay? And that is certainly something that has been shown. This was actually um, done from the, this is the New York study that a lot of people had heard about, where they do talk about significant dropping of the antibody levels, especially as children um, get um, get older and the more away that they're, um, it was from the actual vaccine dose. So yes, antibody levels start to drop as soon as the, va the vaccine um, further away it goes and goes down further to the point where there wasn't nearly the level of protection a couple months later. I do want to point out, though, that the state of Florida is referring to this document that specifically says that it's a preprint, has not been peer-reviewed, uh, peer and also it reports new medical research that has yet to be evaluated and so should not be used to guide clinical practice. So I don't really question whether this data is going to turn out to be right, but it seems to be kind of strange that the state of Florida is telling physicians, use this document to guide your clinical practice, to guide parents, to guide clinical practice, when the author specifically says should not use it for clinical practice. So there's a discordance there in terms of what the authors are trying to say here relative to what the state is using as evidence as why kids should not be vaccinated. Now, in addition to that, moving forward, the risk of myocarditis is um, due to the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, the myocarditis is certainly something that we know about that can happen from the vaccine. We know it is significantly more likely to happen, especially in young and adolescent boys slash men. Um, here you can see that the order, and this is in JAMA, which is certainly one of the more prestigious um, journals in the world, based upon um, positive surveillance and import, the risk of myocarditis um, was increased across multiple ages in sex strata um, and was highest after the second dose and in adolescent males and young men. This risk should be considered into the context of the benefits of the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, one of the things that's not discussed here and furthermore not discussed in the Florida discussion is the fact that myocarditis does happen from wild COVID um, virus itself. And as I had presented previously, from what I've seen, the severity of that myocarditis seems to be worse relative to the people who had been vaccinated. So not to say that vaccine-induced myocarditis is not a significant thing and is not something that we would like to avoid. But of course, we always want to be weighing it against the risk versus benefit of the wild disease of which myocarditis happens there too. And I have not seen a great study comparing those two relative to the frequency compared to the severity of both of those things, whether myocarditis has happened from the vaccine or from the wild virus. Okay, so now the state of Florida then went on to show a couple other things here. They discussed the clinical trial here for healthy children age 11, where there were no cases of severe among the children compared to placebo. 
that's kind of the exact same thing that they said here. So I'm not quite sure why they are quoting it. It's the same study here. So they're quoting it down here. It would be nice if the state of Florida were actually giving up an abundance of evidence and not repeating, not regurgitating the same questions here too. And again, the study is out of New York and myocarditis. So it just seems here as if they're kind of just restating the same things that they're saying up above. And in all honesty, I have seen a lot more data out there that does talk about the risk of the vaccines. Um, that should be part of the conversation. So I'm not even sure why the state of Florida is presenting this particular information as a whole. Um, here you see that the um, discussion for the FDA advisory committee regarding um, vaccination versus healthy um, children. The debate can be found here. I did not look at through this entire thing. I believe I am considered part of that debate, though, because as you may know, I was part of this conversation when, when, when it came forth originally. Okay, so what is my take home message on all of this? So first of all, I do think that there is a subtle difference as to what it says here versus what the what the Surgeon General said, because he was basically saying Florida says we recommend don't vaccinate for children, healthy children. Whereas this seems to be more saying we are not recommending, the state of Florida is not recommending that the children be vaccinated. But that's a bit of a difference, saying we recommend don't versus we cannot recommend do, although certainly both not in at all agreement with what the CDC and what the Academy of Pediatrics says. There is a difference between the statement that the, that the Surgeon General said and what this official paper here is saying. So I'm, it's so you know, I, I do believe that the data is not there, and as I've shown here, to support what the Surgeon in general said where the risks were outweighing the benefits by then saying that the, that, they, that they should not. So that is there. Now, what does that mean in reality? As I said before, I think this is a very individual case-by-case -case situation. Who needs to be vaccinated? That's up to you to decide. That's for the population, for the doctors, for the, for the patients, for the parents to decide. Who would be at most benefit to a vaccine would be people who have no immunity whatsoever or those around people who are at high risk, as we said before. And of course, the children who are at higher risk and therefore more at likely of having a more serious case of COVID. Now, this is information that, again, I wanted to put forth to you so that you can make your own decisions. And I really hope that this helps clarify things. But as I said, I think that this is a more open discussion. I hope that there'll be more data that will come forth as we move forward. But I also see that the data is not strong enough here to say what the Surgeon General said originally. And ultimately, it's going to be up to the choice of the parent as to what to do. So thank you, everybody, for watching. Hopefully, you are now subscribed to this YouTube channel. Hopefully, you will check us out on our Patreon, where we're continuing to put some additional um, exclusive content up there. And I hope everybody has a great day. Bye now.